Okay. I guess with that, I will call to order the September 19th, 2012, City of Santa Barbara Airport Commission meeting. Uh, roll call, please. John Clark. Scott Tracy. Chris Colbert. Here. William Gilbert. Here. Patricia Griffin. Here. Kirk Martin. Bruce Miller. Here. Okay. Uh, do we have any changes to the agenda? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is now the portion for the open public comment. Uh, any member of the public may address the airport commission on a subject within its jurisdiction that's not scheduled before them today. Uh, the scheduled items would come with the item. Total time for public comment, 15 minutes. I have one speaker slip. Uh, from Mr. Librero. I hope I got that right. Yes, could you, if you had a statement, could you please come up to the podium? Hi, and um, I am, this is pretty improvised. It's just about a couple questions. Uh, basically, yes, regarding uh, air traffic, uh, noise abatement, uh, trying to see if there's a possibility of changing the visual approach to landing. And, uh, you know, from the south side coming through, I'm talking more Mesa area. Mm. Um, because according to, you know, the, the maps you guys uh, give us uh, uh, about what the route should be, uh, we experiment a number in like 70 flights a day that come right through where they, you know, uh, where they, I, I am assuming they are having a visual approach to the to the airport way before, and uh, they are overflying all Patterson area and and beyond quite uh, heavily. I think that the last couple months, especially, and uh, what I wanted to ask is if there, has there been any increase in flights in the last year? No. no. The, the Actually, our operations are down. Are down. Oh, God. Um, and and this, this goes for private jets, too? Uh, pretty much. I mean, overall, our operations are down. Okay. Is there going to be an increase in flights in the future? I have no way of uh, predicting that. I okay. mean, it depends on, you know, what the airlines do and then general aviation. Uh, in, in fact, I don't know if you want to stay for our... Uh, master plan presentation because yeah. they'll talk a little bit about the forecast for the future. Yes. Um, right. And <clears throat> since we can't really discuss this in depth tonight, what I would like to suggest is that you give your phone number to Tracy Lincoln, our operations manager. Okay. And Perfect. he can talk to you and um, kind of tell you what we can do, what we can't do, and, and all that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add that, you know, certainly noise is a, a huge consideration to the airport. There's also a noise abatement uh, subcommittee that meets, uh, I think it's every other month or every quarterly. Quarterly. Um, and they are yeah. very kind, very helpful, but they really don't have the tools to mm -hmm. implement uh, to reduce the noise. Mm -hmm. That's a reality. pilots, how they approach the airport. Nobody tells them, hey, don't overfly that area. Try to make sure you go through where the red arrows go. Uh, there's this, all these greenhouses in Patterson, and I'm thinking, why don't they approach right? Actually, these arrows go through there. Nobody flies through there. I live right there on that corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just go, like, in between Hollister and uh, and uh, roads, which, uh, so that's the only thing. It's, um, it's 
big airplanes and there's a lot. And mm -hmm. the noise you can hear it like from inside your house, what you sure. see. And uh, these planes come sometimes to hundred people. Mm -hmm. so well, I know that uh, there is a pretty extensive noise abatement program that the airport has, a noise monitoring program. Um, and uh, Mr. Lincoln here, the operations manager, I would be happy to discuss uh, the issues with you and help, uh, you know, help work with you and talk with the, you know, the noise abatement committee. And um, you know, I, I think it is it's a big concern, and you know, the airport always wants to be good neighbors, so. Um, please do take advantage of talking to Mr. Lincoln and he can work with you. A, a lot of it is uh, dictated by safety and, and the approach is, is, is it, um, it's how they've been developed. Um, but yeah, I think there's certainly a lot of room for dialogue. Um, yeah, unfortunately we can't really get into a long discussion about an off-agenda item, but we're glad to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I do like this. I use the airport a lot, you know, just so I'm there. The thing is, is there an instrumental approach through the north side of the airport? Like, do they approach visually too, or do they get guided, or is there some kind of radar? I don't know what, mm -hmm. but to kind of so that the pilots can come at a, and at a certain point they can. Yeah. Um, the north is actually on this side, but I can tell you know it's a, it's, West. it's a kind of a complicated. There's a lot of complications, and I think um, uh, looks like Mr. Lincoln has got a card for you there. And uh, please do talk talk with him, um, and uh, you know I'm sure that he will and we will do you know what we can. Um, there are there's as you know a noise abatement committee, and uh, they do research complaints and follow up on those and do pilot education if it's warranted. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, okay, uh, thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, thank you. Somebody's very quiet. All right, uh, notices, and uh, that is that the Ground Transportation Subcommittee Met on Thursday, September 6, 2012. Um, I think we may, we'll probably have a report or some mention of that. Uh, on Thursday, September 13th, the Airport Commission Secretary duly posted this agenda on the bulletin board at the Airport Administration Building. And Thursday, September 20th, 2012, at 4 p.m., there will be a joint meeting of the Airport Commission Architectural Board of Review and the Visual Arts in Public Places Committee. The meeting will be held at the David Gebhardt Public Meeting Room, 630 Garden Street, Santa Barbara. That would be tomorrow afternoon, and I believe the item there is the uh, sculpture, the winged memorial or uh, tribute sculpture. Uh, winged sculpture. The winged sculpture. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, minutes. We have a recommendation that the uh, Airport Commission waive the reading and approve the minutes of the meeting Wednesday, July 18th. I second. I'll visit. make a motion. All right. <laughs> we have a second and a motion. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Uh, objections? No. Nope. Uh, the meetings are approved. I mean, the minutes are approved. Uh, the consent calendar. Do we have any changes to the consent calendar? No. All right, the consent calendar being lease agreement with Vista Steel Company, lease agreement with the Green Ridge Sciences Incorporated, lease agreement with the Rezon Inc., and the August property manager report. Do I have a motion? So Just moved. You know, second it. All in favor of accepting, approving the consent calendar? Aye. 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 Against? Consent calendar is approved. Liaison reports. I believe I saw our City of Santa Barbara liaison, Council Member Randy Rouse. Welcome. Good evening. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is <clears throat> Santa Barbara City Council met last night and uh, discussed on the consent calendar, voted on consent calendar for the, I believe it was the signature lease, mm -hmm. which was approved. In addition, we also had a report about our climate action uh, plan and airport staff attended as well. And uh, as it turned out, we found out the staff actually has done an amazingly good job of not only saving the city money, but also uh, getting our, our, uh, our resources within the caps set far off in the future. So we're way ahead of the game. So that's awfully nice to uh, be able to report. Uh, in addition, uh, we do have upcoming, and I um, forgive me, I don't remember the exact date on the agenda, the, the, the end of the 90-day naming process period. October 30th. October 30th, that somebody remembered over there. Thank you, okay. thank you, Karen. Uh, at which time, um, <clears throat> I guess we'll take the public input on the name report. And as I recall from being at uh, these meetings and speaking with some of you individually, I think the, the, uh, that I can report that the consensus of this committee is that uh, you know, no name is a good name at this point in time, if I'm, if I'm correct. And assuming that, then I will report that to the council at, during that time. Is that, a, is that uh, yeah. I, I believe that represents the I opinion think, does that represent you accurately? It, it I think it found no, need, no compelling need for a name at this That's time. That's correct. I think how that was put roughly. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. And uh, I'll take any questions. Otherwise, that's all I have for this report. Any questions for the council? I, I have a, yes. a question. Uh, Councilman, are you seeing any um, concerted uh, response to the naming opportunity to the terminal? Not in particular. Obviously, it was a, a very large push for yes. the Ricard right. situation as well as Dwight Murphy. Other ones have been uh, in editorials, letters to the editor, that type of thing, but no real concerted effort towards that. Okay. So I think the biggest one was obviously Jack Ricard at that time, but once again, that was a, a very small and focused group. So uh, right. when it comes to the public comment and the opinions therein, we'll take that all into consideration and also uh, the airport commission and, and how you feel about it. Right. Thank you. Good. Thank all you. right. Thank you. And we also have. Uh, a city of Goleta uh, stand-in liaison, <laughs> I believe. Mayor Easton. Yes. Uh, Mayor Ed Easton. Easton. Oh, yes. Mayor, Mayor Ed Easton. Easton. I only come here as a substitute for your regular attendee. Uh, <laughs> Councilman Mayor Pro Tem has said this. Uh, two items to talk about. Um, I have seen, not studied, but I have seen the response of the City of Kalita to SB CAG's uh, designation of, uh, I hesitate because I don't know exactly the right name to call it, but all of the zones around the airport that they have designated. Um, this causes some particular angst on the part of the City of Kalita since you sit in the middle of the city of Goleta, and this has some fairly significant impacts on land use. Um, I have known the planner on this project for some time. He is remarkable in his uh, capability uh, to understand and use complexity, um, and at yet I have not seen what the restrictions on the uses are for the various and sundry zones that have been designated. Uh, apparently you need a planner to be able to explain that. And since a planner didn't come along with the letter that I read, uh, I have not yet begun to be fully um, vested in that. Uh, but I'm sure that the city of Goleta's council will be vested in that at some time in the future and may have Apparently, there's a lot more flexibility on the part of the uh, the regulations for this that have not been um, observed by the planner who drew the plan. So we will. This is a work in progress. My my second item is less of perhaps of less substance, uh, but the name Ed Graper means something in the city of Goleta. Uh, means something very, very important and very useful. And uh, uh, we 
He's a volunteer. He works on behalf of the city and the city being a beautiful place. He took the occasion not too long ago to uh, uh, do what he normally does, which is he saw what he sees and he stopped and took care of the problem to discover that he had a police officer ticketing him for having parked beside a red curb. He has no question that he was in violation of the law. But what he was doing was doing what he does in the city of Goleta on a fairly continual basis, which is to wipe out graffiti. And the city manager said, well, you know, I don't normally do this sort of thing, but Ed, you know, I'll take care of that with our, with our deputy sheriffs. Oh, no, he said, it wasn't, it wasn't the city of Goleta. They would never ticket me. It, I, it was the uh, city of Santa Barbara, airport policemen, who ticketed me. Now, I come asking. He paid the ticket. I don't. He want, Don't think he wants his ticket paid for. He disobeyed the law. But at the same time, I would suggest that uh, um, you have a very blank white palette presented to the world. And I would suggest that perhaps we might share Mr. Graper's interest in making sure that graffiti does not ever appear on the walls in Goleta, or at least for very long, and we might share that with the airport. So I would perhaps suggest that you might uh, uh, extend, and you could do it through me, a welcome to Mr. Graper to come and take care of the problems and uh, inform your uh, uh, enforcement people that this is somebody who's doing good things. And if he misses a no parking sign, um, eh, there's discretion, and then there's discretion. Um, I would bring that story to you. Yours to deal with, yours probably to deal with administratively, um, but uh, uh, Ed Graper is his name, and uh, I see his work on a fairly regular basis since I live in Old Town, and uh, I hope that you might have the benefit of his contributions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Easton. And maybe if we have a big white pallet, we should have a mural put up on it. That's <laughs> some public art. <laughs> I have no idea where that might be. But Usually our maintenance crew goes out and uh, paints off. In fact, the, one of the buildings on the north side in the last week or so was like that. So. Well, I, I'm sure we all appreciate Mr. Graper's efforts. Mm -hmm. All right. I believe that takes us then to the administrative reports, the airport master plan status report. Oh, you want me to introduce? Yes. Okay, here yes. I am. It's my right. Oh, okay. Thank you, boss. I'm fighting over it, even. <laughs> I'm not fighting over it. I'm trying to get it to work. I was just trying to line uh, Airport commission, uh, tonight we have a presentation by our master plan consultants, Kaufman and Associates. Uh, to give you an update on the uh, elements that have been completed to date, sort of a summary of that. And uh, we'll also talk about the next steps and the next advisory committee meeting. So I, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jim Harris with Kaufman Associates and uh, Christine Everhart, uh, who is uh, joined with them in, uh, as public outreach. She does our public outreach. So, Jim. Okay. Hazel, thank you. Uh, members of the Commission, thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to be here tonight to uh, give you a, hopefully a brief briefing of the uh, master plan and everything that's been done to date. Uh, essentially a progress report, if you will. Uh, I believe you might have received a handout in advance uh, of this meeting, uh, but I believe there is also a handout on the table in the back of the room that is a, a two-page summary of really the progress of the master plan study to date. Um, 
Tonight, what we'd like to do uh, between Chris and myself is, is just give you an overview of, of where things are at, what work has been completed to date, as Hazel had mentioned, and, and what the next steps are. First of all, uh, just wanted to touch upon the uh, project workflow and really what's in, involved in the master planning effort. Um, as you will recall, your uh, last major planning effort for the airport was the facilities plan, which was, I believe, completed in 2003. Uh, it's not unusual for the FAA and, and airports in general to update their plans on a regular basis to ensure that they're, they're up to date, they're current, they uh, reflect uh, the latest uh, guidelines and policies of the FAA, as well as addressing the local community needs for the airport. So the, the process that was set up for this particular plan uh, follows a format that FAA establishes. Again, FAA provided a funding for the uh, effort as well as local funding from the airport. Uh, so the FAA's process is one that is followed for most airport plans. And uh, in this particular case, this is a 24-month planning effort. We're essentially not quite halfway through it, but uh, to the point that uh, uh, to date, uh, we have completed these, for the most part, represent chapters in the document itself, but we have completed the initiation process, the inventory process, the data gathering that's taken place, forecasting effort, looking at demand forecasts. This is, again, this master plan is looking out 20 years, so we're really taking a look at the way conditions are today, but what do we anticipate uh, that the city and the airport will need to address uh, both in the short, intermediate, and long term for 20 years out. Uh, the demand capacity, once we've identified uh, the demand that's identified in the forecast, where are we deficient uh, at the airport in terms of capacity from an airfield perspective, from a parking perspective, from uh, obviously you've built a beautiful new terminal, so that uh, uh, has taken care of a lot of what had been previous capacity issues with the terminal. Uh, general aviation focus, general aviation needs, uh, a variety of the aviation needs of the airport. So the, uh, uh, once we've gone through this process, which we have done, is it's brought us up to the facility requirements. That's identifying what facilities are going to be needed over the next 20 years. And that's where we're at at this point in the study. Um, we'll talk about a few of the other items coming up, but I wanted to point out a few things that I think are important to this particular study, and I, I think certainly was uh, at the direction of the airport staff and really reaching out to address specific items within the, uh, uh, in this planning effort, one of which is a very detailed environmental uh, inventory and uh, evaluating all of the environmental resources at the airport. So as we're looking at things for the airport, the environment and the resources here are, are uh, a real key factor on how we look at things. Uh, the other part that the, uh, was built into this entire process is public outreach. And I'm just going to hold off on any discussion on that for Chris so she can talk a little bit about the outreach effort that's been going on, which uh, in, in my mind is what these type of studies that we do, uh, the, uh, certainly the city and the airport has has developed a very extensive outreach program, which I think has been important to the input that we've had through this planning effort. Uh, I'm just going to step forward a little bit and just tell you that at this point in time, we are working on the airport alternatives uh, at this point in time. We do anticipate, as Hazel mentioned, having our next Master Plan Advisory Committee meeting on November 28th, um, at which time uh, we'll be reviewing alternatives with the committee and. Uh, uh, getting their feedback into the process. Once we've done that, then we'll start to move forward into establishing a final concept plan for the airport, but essentially the development concept for the next 20 years. <clears throat> that will also involve doing a capital program or a financial plan for the airport, developing a new airport layout plan, which is the document which does go forward to the FAA for their approval as well as local approval. And of course, uh, more environmental review on the selected plan uh, and then moving it through the CEQA process, obviously, before things move forward for final approvals. Uh, so we have a, a ways to go, and this has been designed as a step-by-step -step process, which we will continue to follow and keep you informed along the way. 
I think an important piece of this effort has been the establishment of the guiding uh, principles as we started this process. Uh, I think what was interesting as we moved through this with the committee is, is establishing some principles, which I think you're very familiar with these from the aspect of the airport itself, uh, but they have been applied to uh, the master planning effort. So all of these particular principles are taken into account as we address each element of the, the master plan. Uh, the master plan itself is a demand-based plan. It's, it's designed so as we go through the process and it's completed, you can implement it as demand warrants. It's not a, a build it uh, uh, based upon a certain uh, date. It's based upon activity levels, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But the guiding principles all factor into what we look at and how the plan is implemented. And again, I'll just touch upon those briefly. The safety and security, economic vitality, transportation diversity, community, sustainability, environmental preservation, and cultural resource protection. All of that goes into the evaluation we do, and it's kind of always something that we're looking at as we move through this particular process. Uh, talking about the airport briefly, as I mentioned, one of our steps in this process was a very detailed inventory process of the airport to bring all of the facts and figures and, and data about the airport up to date. It's an important process. It's where we start. Um, and again, just uh, for those, uh, you're obviously I'm, I'm telling you about your airport. This is as much a, an exercise for us, too, is, is making sure that we're knowing as much about the airport as we possibly can. Uh, obviously, the airport sits on just under 1,000 acres of property, uh, which has been highlighted here in red. So it gives you a good depiction of the current de uh, what we call obligated airport property, which is uh, dedicated toward airport uses. Let's see if these will pop up. There's a couple things that should highlight. They may be very difficult to see. Uh, but they're really just uh, what came up are, are the runway dimensions. Uh, again, the primary runway, the east-west runway, which we were just talking about earlier, uh, having been through a recent program to address making sure all the current safety, uh, runway safety areas are addressed for the airport, making sure all of those are in place. Uh, but the existing runway being just over 6,000 feet in length and 150 feet wide, uh, again, the east-west runway, and of course the the two parallel crosswind runways, uh, both of which are about 4,100 feet in length. Um, they make up the runway system itself. And then there's a variety of, uh, I think those will just pop up, but you'll see the, uh, the, the lettering, uh, the nomenclature on all the taxiways. So you, in addition to the runway system, you have the taxiway system. And that's uh, real important as we study the airport and try to make sure that the airport is, a, is as efficient as possible for the aircraft operations and for the safety aspects of the airport. It was also mentioned earlier, instrument approaches. Again, this may be a little difficult to see, but what we tried to highlight here is that the, uh, the primary runway has a variety of different instrument approaches, but has really uh, some of the best approaches you would want at an airport with the instrument landing system. Uh, but you'll also see uh, over time there have been implemented a number of uh, GPS, uh, Global Positioning System, approaches to the airport, the latest technology, which is more reliant upon satellite technology than ground-based uh, aids on the airport. Uh, very important to the airport to ensure that it's serving all aspects of aviation, particularly the scheduled airlines and general <coughs> aviation activity that operates here. The instrument approach capability is, is quite important. One of the items that I talked about that has been completed is the forecasts. Uh, the forecasts, as I mentioned, are important because, as I said, uh, it, it essentially is a snapshot at this point in time and really has been, in our industry, has been very challenging uh, with the economy, uh, oil prices, you name it. There's been a lot of variables that affect how we look at aviation forecasts. But the FAA does require that as we go through this process, we follow several different methodologies that FAA will evaluate and how we look at that. What you see here are the final numbers that were agreed to to submit to the FAA after we had prepared several different scenarios on forecasts, and I know some were involved in the, in the committee process and saw those numbers. Um, 
but we settled on these particular numbers to submit to the FAA. Uh, <laughs> there are two items within the planning process that FAA will actually approve. They don't, at the end of the day, they don't approve your master plan, but they do approve the forecast that you use and they do approve the airport layout plan. Uh, the document essentially is yours and is the basis for everything that you put in your airport layout plan. These particular forecasts um, were developed and submitted to the FAA, and the FAA has reviewed them and has found them to be reasonable. They have asked for a couple minor changes to them, but nothing that would significantly or would at all change the forecast numbers we have here. Uh, so uh, we've coordinated with the FAA, and again, their 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 concern is that the forecasts are reasonable. The uh, the numbers that we're talking about, what we were talking about earlier, there are several different activity indicators that we look at when we're talking about the planning effort. And as you'll see, these are 20-year forecasts, but we do tend to put them more in short, intermediate, and long-term, uh, short being essentially five years, uh, intermediate 10 years, long-term 20. But these are the, uh, the triggers that we would say when we're talking about demand forecasting. So if you were to look at today when we talk about different indicators, there's passenger employments. Those are the, the passenger boardings that you have, the revenue employments at the airport. Um, the other is the based aircraft, how many general aviation based aircraft are there at the airport. And then a real key indicator that you were talking about earlier is operations, takeoff and landings at the airport. Uh, so you'll see, and, and again, if we look at employments, we're about 365,000 total employments today or in, at the end of uh, 2011. Uh, we do anticipate that number growing along with some recovery in the economy and other things happening. Uh, we do see that number growing in the long term to about 657,000 employments. So essentially, not quite a doubling, uh, but certainly a growth that is fairly consistent with the community growth and what we would see in terms of passenger activity locally here. Um, the based aircraft numbers, uh, 178 based aircraft at the airport today growing to about 236 uh, by, again, the 20-year time frame. So general aviation, again, a much slower growth, probably within the general aviation mix of aircraft. You have anything from Cessna 152s, an experimental aircraft, all the way up through the corporate fleet. Probably uh, the corporate fleet is growing a little bit faster than uh, the other GA aircraft, but again, you'll see that in total what it represents. Operationally, we talk about the, uh, we break that down into a lot of segments of aviation, uh, and, and you can clearly see them right there. I won't take you through all the numbers, but the bottom line is, there's just a little over 108,000 takeoff and landings at the airport in 2011. We do see that number growing to 133,000. Uh, so again, you can see that it's uh, about a 30% growth in operations over the next 20 years. Part of that, when you look at some of the numbers, like for example, you in the air carrier end of things, you'll see the numbers don't grow significantly. But that has to do with changes in fleet mix, larger aircraft being operated by the airlines. And what we'll see is going from now, we'll start seeing you change from more 50 passenger aircraft to, to larger aircraft within the fleet. From a capacity standpoint, something we look at from the airfield is uh, what are your capacity issues or do you have capacity issues to handle those operational levels? And, and quite honestly, uh, you're in great shape. Uh, Capacity-wise, your runway system. Uh, this would be your annual service volume, which is just a measure of how how many operations you can accept. These are your forecast numbers, so you're well below annual service volume. <laughs> I thought my time was up. So. <laughs> um, another critical factor in the planning process that we've been through is designation of what's considered your airport reference code and your critical design aircraft. FAA looks at that when you design your facility. The airport staff looks at it when you're designing runway, taxiway, apron areas, things of that nature. And you have a variety of aircraft here, which makes it challenging, of course. Obviously, you have a, anywhere from the smaller single-engine, piston-driven uh, general aviation aircraft all the way through some of the uh, more narrow-body uh, jets up through the 737 class. What FAA considers your critical aircraft are those aircraft which you're, you're – uh, experiencing about 500 annual operations or more each year. Uh, so those get into what's called, from an airport reference code perspective, the, uh, it's an alphanumeric coding system. The, uh, 
The letter uh, designation is the approach speeds of the aircraft, how fast or high performance the aircraft is, and the Roman numerals refer to the wingspans. Uh, so once you equate the two, put them together, it gives you some design categories from which to work. And you can see some of these aircraft right in here are the ones which are most critical to the design features uh, of the Santa Barbara Airport. After we've been through all the forecasting and facility requirements, we've gotten down to what are the major considerations we have to look at for the uh, alternatives. Uh, and we have several airfield considerations that we need to look at as we go through this process. Uh, one is the mitigation of taxiway hotspots. These are high activity areas on taxiways that the FAA and air traffic wants to make sure that they don't lead to potential uh, uh, confusion on these taxiway systems. Make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that we're as efficient as possible, as safe as possible. So we're looking at four of those. Extending taxiway hotel on the north side of runway 7 or uh, 725 to the end of the uh, runway 7 threshold. Uh, again, that would provide a full length parallel taxiway on the north side of the airport. Taxiway exit locations, again, what you're looking for is all those exits to be designed in a way which improves airfield efficiency and uh, uh, makes for a very safe and efficient airfield. Visual approach aids for 15 right, 33 left, that is the uh, crosswind runway. Uh, looking for something along the lines of you know, improved PAPI systems, precision approach path indicators, something that gives good visual descent, gu descent guidance to the pilots. And protection of runway protection zones, there's about 8.7 acres of the runway protection zone area for the parallel crosswind runways that are not technically controlled by the airport in, in terms of owning the property or having an easement over those areas, and that's something that should be explored to see what you could do. From a terminal consideration, obviously you're, you're starting in a great position when uh, you start a plan and you've just built a new terminal. Uh, you really, uh, again, are in great shape for a number of years relative to the size of the terminal. When I'm referring to facility expansion of adding some uh, square footage to the terminal, that's really long term. Uh, right now you're operating, I believe, at about 65% capacity on the terminal, so you're, you're in very good shape there. The gate apron and overflow parking, uh, over time looking at about adding uh, three passenger loading bridges uh, and about 12,000 yards of overflow or diversion apron. You have uh, a lack of some apron space out there, which would be quite helpful uh, to address that uh, during the course of this planning effort. Uh, the, the parking needs are a little more near term um, with the... Uh, uh, looking at it closing uh, the long-term lot too due to the, the flooding issues and the long-term or the uh, operational costs of that. So those, that's an area that needs to be explored through the alternatives process. And a couple more minor items related to the terminal, the labor, uh, laboratory dump station, which is a remotely located now and fairly inefficient location, a new one, and a trash compactor <laughs> to handle the waste. General aviation, uh, this really is looking, this is a pretty extensive part of the effort that's looking at the consolidation of all the GA facilities on the north side uh, of the field. Uh, that opens up some opportunities for the terminal expansion needs and parking needs on the, on the south. Uh, aircraft storage hangar needs, uh, this is definitely an issue that needs to be addressed. That's something we've heard during our meetings is more hangar uh, demand. We need to look at that and how that can be accommodated. General aviation parking, uh, we need more parking spaces to serve general aviation. Uh, sometimes it's usually not that you don't have enough, sometimes it's in the wrong place. You just need to make sure that we look at this very thoroughly during this planning effort. Fuel storage, increase in fuel storage over time. Helicopter parking, uh, big demand uh, to, to look at maybe about 10 more spaces, uh, either in a consolidated area or uh, in different locations on the airfield on the north side. Uh, security fencing, full perimeter security fencing in a couple areas, and then uh, new maintenance facilities possibly will look at that. The existing maintenance yard does uh, experience flooding from time to time, so we'll look at that. And I believe uh, we pretty well touched upon the major issues that we are at this point in time dealing with and starting into the alternatives process, but as I mentioned, I'm going to turn this over to Chris because a real key component has been the help we've gotten through other avenues, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Okay. 
Thank you, Jim. Good evening. We're happy to be here and have this opportunity to give you an update. As Jim mentioned, we're going to uh, shift just a little bit for the last slide into public outreach. Um, and I'd like to give you an update. We've had a very vigorous public outreach uh, with this project. And uh, as you can see by the bullets there, the first is the uh, advisory committee, which two of members of the commission sit on. And I believe we've got at least one other member here tonight that's part of what we call the PAC. And um, we are going to be holding five meetings total, of which uh, we've had uh, three. We had one last December, December 7th, and then the other two have been on the same day as the public meetings. And so the second part of, of that is uh, the, the public workshop portion, and uh, we're going to have a total of four public workshops. And uh, we've had two of those, March 28th and July 11th, I think, was the last one. And as Jim also mentioned, we have scheduled the next one for November 28th. So that will be the third public workshop. And we've had very good attendance at each of the workshops. And um, I think the first one, a lot of the questions were really about the new terminal. Um, and not they were pretty general questions. This last one, the focus was really on hangar space and the desire for um, particularly general aviation uh, corporate hangars and what's happening um, with hangars. We also, um, which I think most of you have seen, but uh, we still do have a supply of the initi initiation brochure that was done at the very beginning of the process, which has been given out to the general public and at each workshop as well as um, the advisory committee members. And it really explains what a master plan is and how an airport master plan differs from what uh, people might think of as a master plan. And so it's a, a good document uh, to give a little background both on the process and what to expect um, in terms of outreach. There also is a pub, uh, project website uh, which is linked through uh, your flysba.com and draft documents are available on the website as well as information about the public workshops um, that have been uh, uh, held as well as certainly be noticed for the November 28th one. Also newspaper ads, uh, for example, the one that was done, I think this is for the July meeting, um, have been very effective and um, it's also been on Facebook and Twitter uh, so it's been very well advertised. Press releases were also developed uh, prior to each workshop and, of course, will be in the future, and we've had good coverage from the media. Um, the last thing that I'll mention uh, is the summary brochure, similar to this initiation one, but it will be done at the completion of the project and is meant for uh, summarizing the outcome and really what will be in the master plan and how the process was conducted. So with that, I think um, we're open for questions. Um, I'll turn it back to Jim. Well, I wanted to thank you for that really great summary. It, it really did a great job of distilling down what's already been a tremendous amount of work. I, I particularly uh, appreciate the, your three slides on the airfield considerations, terminal considerations, general aviation, because they really kind of sum up in a nutshell um, what a lot of the big issues are. And I'm sure more will evolve, but that's, that's a really great list in a concise format. Do we have questions? I have a question. Yes. It has to do with the um, planning element dealing with financial planning. Um, my, you know, I think all of our concern here is the economic self-sufficiency of the airport, uh, given the conservative forecast that you've got for growth, um, looking at our debt service, looking at capital expenditures forecasted, looking at our wish list for as an example, um, par long-term parking solutions. How detailed do you get into the um, into into that level of forecasting? Yeah, when we get into the uh, the capital programming for the airport, we'll be identifying all the particular projects on a year-by-year -year basis, particularly for the first five years, uh, because we'll take a very 
close look at year by year what's what are anticipated needs that need to be undertaken those particular years. But even in the intermediate term and the long term, we'll identify each project on a project by project basis, what the anticipated estimated cost of that project will be, what the potential funding sources will be for that project, whether they be uh, potential for FAA funding or uh, it be a combination FAA local mm -hmm. share or PFC uh, backed. Uh, or if it's uh, totally uh, locally funded, ineligible for FAA funding. So we'll break it down to the point you'll have a good assessment of what the city share, the airport share, will be for each and every project. Uh, that will give you an overall idea of what's needed over time. Now, again, when we talk about eligibility, uh, you know, demand is one thing, and then, of course, financial capability year to year uh, to do the project is another. And not necessarily on the airport side, per se, but FAA as well, because a lot of this will involve discretionary funding from FAA, and those programs are, as you know, uh, sometimes difficult to predict where they will go. Right. Uh, but we will identify those that are eligible and which, uh, which can be identified uh, as to what the local share will be. We're not taking it necessarily beyond that to where we're going to get into real detail on the financial program. I think, as you do right now, you do some long-term capital needs or I'm sorry short term capital needs and you start to assess your financial based upon what's in the plan as i said it's a demand based plan so the in, the indicators must be there to justify the project whether it be locally uh, or even FAA. FAA will not consider a project unless it's fully justified. So we'll have those activity indicators that you can look at to see whether a project is warranted and then what the cost will be. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'll be happy to help you on the uh, visual aid for 1533. Okay. I'll paint an arrow on my roof and so say you're <laughs> right up with that. Okay. So right in the path. Well, that, that helps with the cost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both again for that excellent uh, summary. Okay, that takes us to the Ground Transportation Subcommittee update. I suspect Mr. Lincoln will be presenting. As you know, um, Tracy has been working long and hard on developing a new tra ground transportation program for the airport, and uh, the ground transportation subcommittee has been working along with him, as well as industry um, cab owners and, and limousine driver uh, owners and that, and that sort of thing. So I thought it would be good at this point just to bring uh, Commission up to speed what the uh, subcommittee has been working on, just so that when we finally uh, come to you to uh, approve the program, you have some background. The subcommittee, the subcommittee did meet again with, um, and we had many of the limousine and shuttle operators attended. Notices were sent out to everyone. The, uh, the program, the draft program that was presented to the subcommittee uh, was not recommended during that meeting. The results of the meeting, there were some participants in the meeting, specifically the um, charter party carriers that operate limousines and shuttles and prearranged transportation services. Uh, they had some concern with potential permit cost. Uh, the on-demand cabs, um, have seen the draft program that is being recommended and uh, and haven't voiced they they voiced some concern but they're okay with it and the limo folks and the shuttle operators we have a little ways to go to try and uh, meet with them again and see if we can either come to an agreement or kind of understand each other's viewpoints on that I'm doing some digging right now to get some additional cost information I've got quite a bit already but uh, once I get that, I'll meet with those operators. Then I'll either revise the plan or not, and we will come back to the subcommittee and and discuss it at that time. But there was a there is a draft plan that was presented, and we're going back to possibly modify one element of it. Tracy, why don't you um, just generally describe what's in the plan? Uh, the plan contains permit and fee requirements and policies for the operations of all commercial ground transportation, specifically for on-demand cabs that will wait here at the airport. There's monthly permit fees, 
annual agreement fees and then per trip fees for those folks. For other folks that currently operate with no permit at all, which is everybody except Roadrunner Shuttle, uh, they will, and at this airport only, there are required permits at pretty much every airport in the country. Uh, we will be coming online with our own ordinance requiring permits of them. And again, they have, well, they will also pay per trip fees and some vehicle permit fees and agreements. The only issue that the, uh, the charter party carriers who operate the prearranged services right now, the issue that they have is a vehicle permit fee cost as opposed to the annual operating agreement or the per trip fee. So that's the one stumbling point we're working on with them. But to, to kind of put it in a nutshell, uh, currently only on-demand cabs and on-demand shuttle have a permit. When we are done with the program, all of the commercial operators that operate in or out will be required to have a permit. And the prearranged service permits are um, quite a bit less money than the than the on-demand taxi cab. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to point out that this is not a program just to implement fees for the mm -hmm. sake of fees or a program. There, there's really a matter of it's necessity and public convenience. There are a lot of issues that this program intends to resolve in terms of you know the flow of the taxis, the shuttles, the availability, the uh, kind of maintaining the order, um, and so the, the fees are really there to support the program, not fees to support some other program. Uh, that, that is the point of the That's program. That's completely correct, and thank you for yeah. pointing that out. The fee will cover the cost of a customer service rep on that Center Islands to assist both the transportation providers and the customers with, with questions and, and cab starting. And there are several very difficult operational issues that we've have existed for a while and have gotten worse with construction and the loss of some previous facilities. I've had pages and pages of logs of difficult operational issues with cabs and shuttles, so we, we do need some tighter controls out there to get a handle on it. Yeah, I think many of us, at least I know myself, on the, the subcommittee when this was first presented, I, you know, it, it was important to really understand what what the issues are and why this is being done and I know that you know my instinct is always you know you know wait you don't need to implement a bunch more stuff if you don't have a problem but there is a problem and that's what this is about um, I also um, wanted to mention again um, I know at the last meeting I suggested and it seems that many of the, the limo companies were very um, enthusiastic about the idea of um, having a dedicated set of spaces at the front of the short-term lot to uh, to stage in and to resolve possibly the problem when you know they can't leave their vehicle un unattended but uh, need to assist somebody to or from the terminal. So I hope that's something that we can uh, pursue there because they, they seem to be very uh, interested in that sort of an arrangement. Yeah, we'll be looking at that with our parking lot operator and having those discussions with them. Yeah. So question, how will it be monitored since there are so many cab companies out there that are one cab? <laughs> I mean, there's one guy and one car. How do you monitor that each one of them when they're coming in to pick up a passenger has a permit, has, is licensed or whatever you want to call it? Down the road a piece, we'll have an automatic vehicle identification system. In the meantime, our, um, our staff that work the curb, both the person that will be working the center island as well as our ground transportation, uh, kind of our, our traffic aides that work the curb, they will all be trained on what the permits look like, where the permits go, and when each vehicle pulls in, a permit will be needed. I might say the operators have no problem in telling on those that <laughs> don't <laughs> have it. <laughs> uh, another important point is the operators have requested a permit program. I have had many calls from limos, shuttles. They don't mind paying because they know once they get a permit program, they get some order out there and they get a little bit better service and they get a place to park and they've not had that in the past. They're either parking in short term and walking in or they're going around loops. So it is a difficult situation. The program's not about implementing a bunch of new fees. It really is about getting a handle on some pretty serious operational issues we have. They've been ongoing for a while, but recently the construction's kind of amplified it. Any other questions? 
and ground transportation. Okay. No. Takes us to the next item that I'm sure we've all been eagerly awaiting, the <laughs> preliminary <laughs> fiscal year 2012 year-end review. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> Bummer. Thank you, uh, Commission. Uh, as you indicated, it is the preliminary report. Uh, the final report will be going to Council on October 3rd. Um, so we should have our uh, comprehensive numbers at that point. But I do think that our uh, year end ended well. And um, we started the year, as you recall, uh, thinking that we'd be in the terminal in July, and we actually went in in August. Uh, we thought airline activity and passenger traffic would be flat, but we actually saw just a very slight increase at 1.35%. My numbers are fiscal year, not calendar year. Um, we also indicated that we would probably maintain commercial industrial uh, revenues and our vacancy rates, um, and those have remained constant. And we also anticipated an increase in, in general aviation activity operations uh, somewhat, but also recall that we entered into two new lease agreements uh, with both of the FBOs to extend those leases until uh, 2016 during our master plan process. So there are additional adjustments, uh, rental adjustments in there. Uh, and we also have the um, general aviation landing fee, which has been uh, very uh, good for us. So our total revenues this year came in at $14.7 million. Uh, commercial industrial revenue is at 4.2%. Non-commercial uh, aviation, that's GA activity, uh, exceeded budget by 10.1%. Airline con uh, concessions, however, uh, were not overall up. Uh, rental cars are up and doing extremely well. We did the RFP. We have seven rental car companies, so that has made a difference. Parking has been severely impacted with construction, no short-term parking. Um, I think generally the public would like to just avoid the parking lot at this point, so uh, next year that should be better. Food and beverage and gift shop, even though it's under our estimate, it's substantially higher than it was last year. Uh, being in the new terminal, both uh, concessionaires, the gift shop as well as the restaurant, are really very pleased with the, the revenues and the, the uh, uh, amount of revenue that they're generating per in-plane passenger. Uh, commercial aviation, once again, it did not meet our projections. Uh, two ways landing fees were below, and also our boarding bridge fees were not uh, on target. Part of that was one boarding bridge has been out of commission being used s differently because of construction. We had to close gate five, the escalators going down because the ramp construction, so they literally were using it to ground board um, passengers, and so therefore there was no aircraft using it directly. So that impacted us. Interest income, the city invests their uh, funds very conservatively. So we were down 15%. Plus, we've spent some money that we've had uh, in our reserves uh, for the terminal project. TSA continues their contract to reimburse the airport for um, our patrol officers responding to the checkpoint. And this year, it exceeded what we had in the budget, but that's because we collected what they didn't pay the last fiscal year. So that's why it's higher. We also had unanticipated uh, revenues, which we're always excited to receive. <laughs> uh, worker comp rebate, $300,000, and that's um, a direct result of the city's effort to have well employees and to really stress safety on the job. And so we benefited by that by receiving back monies that we had paid to the city for worker comp, uh, $300,000. We also closed out two FAA grants, and we didn't spend all the money on those grants. <coughs> we did the project under budget. And so uh, the $150,000 is a portion of our match for those grant funds that were returned. And I have to say, this is the first time in my 20-some-odd years here at the airport that the ARF costs came in under budget. Uh, and I know <laughs> that's hard to believe, but $120,000 under budget. So our total revenues creeped up 1.3% above our budget. This uh, 
slide you saw when we submitted our budget for 2013, but I have come back in and, and we've finalized the numbers, the pre preliminary final numbers for 2012 to give you an idea of where we are um, on our total amount by uh, major uh, revenue source and also the history of 2011 and our projection for 2013. Our expenditures were also under budget. Uh, once again, salaries and benefits, a couple of reasons. We continued to have furlough savings, which um, expired July 1st, so we will not have furlough savings that, well, I shouldn't say that we should have some because the TAP unit, um, treatment and patrol unit will have a small amount of uh, furlough savings in this next fiscal year, but the rest, the general unit in management will not. We continue to have vacancies in patrol and have had some in the maintenance division as well. Um, <coughs> but overall, we were 6.2% below budget in our operations. Supplies and services, once again, we were below, partly because we were in the terminal late partly because we were estimating expenses that we really had no foundation or no history to base those on. So uh, this next year's budget will be uh, much tighter in that regard. We will know what we're spending. Our, uh, as I said, came in uh, below budget, and so did our parking shuttle operation. And we, had, at mid-year, we reached out and said we really need to conserve as much as we can, and they too. Uh, participated in that and we did have a savings in parking shuttle which is good this slide shows you the same as the revenues except its expenditures and uh, so you'll see that we had 11.8 million dollars in total expenditures for the year and our debt service uh, which was paid June 30th 1.1 million dollars which is half of a full year's debt service we had capitalized interest paying the debt service prior to that time. So overall, revenue slightly above, uh, making an allowance for the, the late opening of the terminal uh, and expenditures below. And um, that concludes my report. Well, congratulations. I know there was an awful lot uh, of unknowns with the new terminal and a lot of things kind of in motion. Uh, uh, do we have questions? I think Commissioner Colbert may have questions. I do. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it to one. And it, uh, zeroing in on appropriated reserves, yes. which uh, gives me all sorts of angst. Um, um, I noticed that the, for the forecast for 2013, it's about I don't know, roughly 50 percent lower than 2012. If, it, if, if you want to put that, you've got appropriated reserve, uh, reserves adopted at 242,000 oh. and recommended at 104. Mm -hmm. um, now, can you fillet that, res is the appropriate reserves cover all of our reserve requirements? Mm -hmm. I, okay. So this is my mm -hmm. angst, is not knowing what our obligations are to meet reserves. I know what our obligations are to meet debt service, but you know there's that other obligation. So can you just speak to that and how our outlook looks for um, this forecast? Okay. To answer your question about appropriated reserves first, the city requires in budget preparation that each department uh, include one half of one percent of your operating budget uh, under appropriate reserves. In 2012, we exceeded that because we had anticipated revenues greater than expenses. So in order to balance, we put the additional revenue uh, to balance the revenue, we put it in appropriated reserve as our expenditure. We did the same thing in 2013. As far as the city's mandated policy reserves for economic contingency, future year budget, and the capital, those I haven't brought to you because I want to wait until the very final numbers come in. 
we were totally funded, fully funded last year and have been since they were established by the city in the early 90s, right. which is about $4 million, a little over $4 million. But that's the chart you'll get next time that will show not only that we're fully funded, but if we had any revenues above expenditures uh, at the end of the year, uh, those monies could be applied for a couple of things. One in particular would be our match with FAA grants. That's a priority. Mm -hmm. And then any capital that we could do. Or we may decide that we want to just reserve some and just keep it as a savings account for unanticipated expenses mm -hmm. for the terminal right. or for whatever. Right. And But we will bring that just as soon. I have a meeting tomorrow morning. Okay. And we'll come back. Reading your mind. Okay. I, I just love to see the relationship <laughs> of this He's projected you know, the net revenues with our capital reserve requirements. Right. Right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Will you at that time also be giving us an update on the capital program? I know there was a lot of stuff that uh, <laughs> slid. <laughs> it's coming right up. And in fact, Andrew and I attended a meeting today, uh, the kickoff meeting for the capital program. And we've been working on that for the last couple of months. Um, one thing that the city administrator mentioned today, which is uh, a good thing for us, is to kind of don't just focus on those that you can pay for, focus on what the needs are, and dream a little bit. Whoa. So we have been dreaming. Yeah. We have been taking a list of all the, the needs that we can identify. So you will see a lot of unfunded capital projects because, one, we don't have the money, but two, we want to keep them on the books to talk about those in the future and certainly seek any revenue source that's available regardless of um, where that money might come from, economic development money. We're, we're interested in other grants as well. So that will be coming to Airport Commission uh, next month, October 17th, uh, and we will meet with the uh, budget review, uh, budget subcommittee, um, hopefully the, a week before that. Uh, we have a meeting. Andrew scheduled a meeting for Friday for us to get together to kind of circle the wagons and get started on providing the detail that you'll need in order to review that. Great. Thank you. I'm sure mm -hmm. we're looking forward to that. <laughs> Other questions? Mm -hmm. Comments? Compliments. Compliments. Mm -hmm. Compliments. You. No, great job. Thank you. All right. Okay. That then leaves us with the director's report. Unfortunately, this evening I don't have a passenger count. Uh, American Eagle had some issues with their uh, the information that they normally provide us. So, but I figured uh, the lowest uh, passenger count that, that they had, American Eagle had this year, was mm. in February. And if I use that to add on to everybody else, we'd still be a little over uh, mm -hmm. an increase in passengers. So uh, we will uh, bring the. the passenger report next month for uh, August. Um, on air service, uh, Alaska Airlines uh, service airline, of course, has, has gone away for the, so hopefully next season, and they did very, very well. Mm -hmm. They were very pleased, so um, I'm looking forward to them starting up again next year and maybe at some point year-round service. Uh, master plan you heard about, and tomorrow we'll uh, meet with the Visual Arts and Public Places Committee about the uh, glass sculpture. Um, the airline terminal naming uh, put out a press release, um, you know, inviting the public of uh, what council's action was uh, to delay any decision on naming the terminal for 90 days, and if people had. Uh, a suggestion for a name or they just want to give an opinion about naming it. Uh, and I've received quite a few um, emails uh, regarding that and I'll be presenting all that information to council uh, on October 30th when the United States is up. Rather interesting. Okay. Oh, I can tell. Um, it's been rather interesting. There's pretty much so much far, I think, a majority for just leaving at the Santa Barbara Airport Terminal. Um, but there's been a variety of other uh, 
names that have been suggested as well. So just to bring you up to speed on that. Um, the terminal project, we're really getting close to the end of the project. Um, in the next couple of weeks, opening up the short-term lot, uh, the historic terminal looks just gorgeous. Um, they've done a wonderful job on it, and I think people will be, the community will be pleasantly surprised at seeing what it looked like uh, in 1942. Or maybe better than it looks Actually, like. Actually, it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the yeah. Granada. <laughs> uh, um, Good point. And I've been working with the Santa Barbara Historical Museum uh, on the history displays. We've contracted with them to design them and fabricate them and install them. So yeah. that's been great, a, a big relief for me. And um, so I, I think you'll be really pleased uh, when the project is, is done uh, with the historic terminal and then they'll finish the landscaping and of course short-term parking which is needed desperately. Oh my God. Uh, Will there be a mini opening for the... Uh, yes, we'll have a mini gala. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, you know, we'll have some uh, small event to celebrate the end of the project. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't duplicate the gala in that little building. <laughs> um, and I guess that's it in terms of um, what I was going to point out. If you have any other item that's on the uh, director's report you'd like me to speak to, I'd be happy to. Well, there is, of course, the former Chrysler dealership building. Yes, it's gone. It's the gone. Fine, there. empty space you have there. Now. Yes, they did a great job. It looks so much better. Um, and also getting a building that was in seriously bad shape. Um, taken away. So, uh, yes, and it was in the approach zone. So, okay. All right. Any questions, comments on the director's report? Seeing none, that brings us to the adjournment. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.